Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And it's really great to be here. Uh, it was an honor for me to, to be part of the first meetup uh, that you organized and now to be opening the, 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 the first community day is so, so wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. So the idea of this session is uh, to, to really start the day with an introduction of the power that uh, cloud computing gives you to, 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 to really create and build uh, your ideas. And if we look at, uh, uh, at how often uh, you start, if you don't use the cloud, we see that you build something and maybe you deploy it on a, on a, on a single server. And then your customer arrive and then start using your application and that works. Uh, and everyone is happy until they're not, because if you put all your eggs into a, a single basket, then it's quite easy that something at some point goes wrong and, uh, and nothing works anymore. So how can you avoid that? So you need first to take out your data, your database, and then you can look into your application part and you can replicate your application into maybe a couple of servers instead of using one. And now you start to have three components that you have to manage. And then probably you need to add a load balancer to control how uh, traffic is distributed from your users to the uh, different application servers. And, and now you have this, a similar problem of availability uh, uh, on the database because you can uh, recover if an application server fails, but you need to replicate your database as well. Uh, and now if also the database fails, you can uh, move to the other uh, node. So as you see, there's lots of stuff that you have to do just to, to put your application live. Uh, if you move to the cloud, you can almost map one-to-one -one, uh, the, the resources that we saw before into uh, components that uh, uh, AWS provides. So you can use the uh, application load balancer, you can use EC2 instances for your uh, application server. Uh, you can start uh, getting things easier by using a fully managed database like those provided by Amazon RDS. Uh, in this way, for example, availability is fully managed by us. Uh, and actually, two application servers is not a great number. And generally speaking, uh, as a suggestion, two is never a great number for availability. It's much better to use three or a higher number, because if something fails, at least you have two thirds of the capabilities still online. Uh, and the great thing of the cloud is that uh, you can use automation. So you can use things like uh, auto scaling to uh, automate uh, the number of uh, instances that you want to use and replace them as they uh, in case they fail uh, for your because there's a problem in your application there's an hardware problem on our side and on the database you can use many options but scaling the database is quite difficult it's not just as easy as adding new servers like in the application space that's why over the years we worked and created amazon aurora amazon aurora allows you to uh, scale your relational database easier. Uh, but another advantage of the cloud is that uh, you, you get freedom from uh, your database, from database technologies. You can really use many purpose-built databases to uh, simplify the way you want to manage and store the data for your application. So you can use, for example, DynamoDB, that is a super highly scalable uh, NoSQL database that we use a lot also for uh, uh, Amazon Retail. Uh, it can scale from a few transactions per second to millions of transactions per second on a single table. Uh, you can use uh, NoSQL options that are compatible with MongoDB or with Apache Cassandra using uh, platforms like uh, Amazon DocumentDB or Amazon Keyspaces. Or you can use, as I said before, purpose-built databases uh, like Neptune or QLDB. So if you need a graph databases, if you have highly connected data where relationship is very important, or uh, if you need to uh, keep the full history uh, of, uh, of changes of your databases, because maybe this is uh, really important for your business, you can use what you, we call a ledger databases like Amazon QLDB. Yeah. QLDB is something that we use in a similar form for, uh, for example, for the control plane of some of our services like EC2. Also for, compute, for computation, uh, managing server is, is probably not the most flexible ways, even if we, if we use autoscaling. Uh, so you can start to maybe decompose your application in smaller components and use containers to contain these components and uh, distribute these components in a standard way across development or your test environment and production. And 
to manage these containers, you can use tools like Amazon ECS or Amazon EPS. So if you tools that can uh, schedule and run your containers uh, depending on, 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 on your application. Uh, actually, with uh, these schedulers, you don't manage uh, specific containers, you manage the deployment unit. There can be one or more containers that you deploy in a single place. And this is called task with ECS or a, a pod with the Kubernetes. And uh, normally you aggregate these tasks and pods into a service that contains also information on availability and how the traffic might be, should be distributed across the multiple tasks and the multiple pods. But still you have to manage servers to run these containers. So another step that can help you uh, leverage the power of the cloud and, 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 and let us do more for you is to don't remove manage the cluster at all, but uh, use a tool like AWS Fargate to just run containers, specify how much memory, how much CPU you need, uh, and let us uh, find the right resources for, uh, for running your workloads. So Fargate really make it easier to run containers uh, without having to manage the underlying infrastructure. And we're starting to get something much easier to manage than, 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 than the servers before. The next step, I, uh, and, uh, that, and we will see also today with other presentations on this topic, is to think differently. So instead of having your application running uh, as it's uh, always running, think of your application as something that runs based on events. So if something happens, you trigger a function uh, like those provided by AWS Lambda, and your function that is written with your code uh, can be uh, almost any programming language you want. Uh, can just uh, use any service on the, on AWS or on the internet to to implement your business logic and return, uh, for example, an answer. And it's very easy to build, uh, for example, a web application using uh, Lambda functions. So you need an entry point like an Amazon API gateway or a load balancer, or you, you can even call them directly from an SDK. And this function can implement the logic, the business logic of your backend and use uh, many of the databases that we mentioned before. So probably DynamoDB is a very popular choices, choice, but you can use also others. And normally at this point, you put your static asset uh, into a uh, storage like Amazon S3. So your HTML files, your JavaScript running on the client, on the browser, uh, and this can be loaded by the browser and then from the uh, javascript that is loaded from the, from the client browser they, it can start this interaction between the client and the backend uh, using an event-driven architecture and for authentication you can use a tool like uh, amazon cognito or a third-party tool like out zero uh, in this way you can uh, simplify also the management of authentication it is another burden that is often repeated across multiple applications so what about availability and scalability of these solutions? Uh, so this is another great power of the cloud because for example, with AWS, uh, we have now uh, 24 regions globally with three more coming. And each of these region is actually built using multiple uh, locations. Uh, normally, uh, normally most of regions are at three uh, distinct locations and we call these locations availability zones. And each availability zone is built with one or more data centers. And then you can distribute your application within the region across multiple data centers by just using these availability zones. This is increasing the reliability of your solution a lot. And it's very difficult to do this with traditional infrastructure. If you use a service like uh, EC2, the virtual servers, uh, you can pick and choose which availability zone to use so the different spread your architecture across multiple data centers. Uh, you can automate that uh, again using auto scaling groups. So you can create an auto scaling group for your web or application server and say hey, spread this uh, web application servers across uh, all the availability zones that I have. And this will be managed automatically as the number of servers scales up and down. And something similar you can do with containers. So when you create a service with ECS, KS, you can configure the way this interaction should work uh, with the availability zones and spread and distribute your workload. If you start to use a fully managed service like the Elastic Load Balancer, for example, as an entry point for your application, then as AWS, we can step in further and help you more. So uh, for example, if you use an Elastic Load Balancer, you just have 
to tell which availability zones to use and we automatically uh, manage the service and distribute the service uh, for you and if you use fully managed services like those of the serverless architecture I showed before. So if you use a storage like S3, a database like DynamoDB, if you use Lambda function or the API gateway, everything is automatically distributed and replicated across these uh, different data centers and these different availability zones. So uh, your architecture, even if it's just a, a single function with a, a, a database table is replicated across multiple data centers without you having to do anything. And this is a, a, a view into, into what we uh, into what you, you, we can see as your responsibility when managing your infrastructure. So depending on the services you use uh, from AWS, from a cloud provider, uh, we can do more or can, we can do less. So if you use services like AWS Lambda or DynamoDB that in this uh, slide are uh, all on the right, we can really uh, step in and take much of the um, infrastructure responsibility for you and, uh, and, uh, and let you have more time free to focus on the unique part of the application that you're building. What about analytics? I think this is another uh, power that the cloud uh, gives, gives that it's not easy to have with the traditional infrastructure. So the application you run that can run on servers or containers on Lambda functions, they produce data they produce data in forms of logs, they can produce data in forms of uh, uh, structured or unstructured content, maybe images that is uploaded by your customers. So how can you uh, manage this data that is normally growing, especially if you adopt a microservice architecture, you have multiple services, you, you, you can really collect many information, a lot of lots of data. What can you do with this data? Uh, how can you store this data? It can be structured information, and as I said before, also unstructured like images or comments uh, to uh, social media, for example. Turns out that an object storage like Amazon S3, it's really easy to use for this purpose because you can put data there, you can create lifecycle rules that can uh, automatically delete data that is older than a specific uh, time frame that you, don't, you, you can configure. You can uh, also uh, set up maybe uh, uh, encryption, uh, you can configure your security, tighten your security. And when the data is there, you can start to use it. Uh, but uh, normally the data that you store is, is, is raw data, it's not so easy to use. So uh, you can implement a layer that can take this raw information and can process this information to make it easier to analyze further. And this is normally called an extract, transform and load layer, uh, ETL uh, as an acronym. And we have a platform for, uh, it's AW, called AWS Glue. It can automatically crawl your data and find uh, the data as is written. Uh, you can create jobs to process and format and clean this data, validate the syntax of this data. And then it, it can uh, update a data catalog that will uh, be the main source of information to know which kind of data is stored in this S3 bucket and write the output, for example, in, a, in another S3 bucket that contains clean prepared data that you can uh, analyze uh, in a much easier way. Uh, you can load this data into a data warehouse like uh, a data, columnar database like uh, Amazon Redshift and then run queries, or you can query the data straight on S3 using Redshift, uh, Redshift Spectrum, or using a, a serverless query engine like uh, Amazon Athena that can run SQL queries straight on S3 files uh, to get an uh, structured information from your uh, repository. So when you start to collect all your data into uh, one or more S3 buckets, uh, permissions are really important. You need to define who can read uh, and who can uh, write what. Uh, and uh, that's why we created a tool that is called AWS Data Lake and with the data, sorry, AWS Lake Formation that can help you configure your data lake and uh, lake formation can set permissions at column level. So even if you have a single S3, uh, single file on S3, you can pick and choose which uh, part of these files, which columns uh, a specific user inside uh, your, uh, your, your, your company can see, read uh, and, and analyze. Uh, so permissions are really important and in this way you can really 
uh, make the step up. And as I said before, you can transform this repository into a proper data lake. It is a way to collect all the information of your company into a single repository. And with the data lake, you can do many things. Uh, for example, you can run more traditional analytics uh, and you run queries using, for example, Athena uh, or Redshift, and you can uh, extract information that you can visualize uh, with a tool like uh, QuickSight. Visualization is really important because as humans, uh, we can't understand complex data if we don't have uh, something visual, something that makes things complex, simple uh, to our eyes. Uh, so visualization is very important to understand the trends of your data, uh, maybe the trends of the, uh, how your customers are uh, growing over time, how your uh, logistic is distributing your products over time and so on. And you can also set up business alerts that can keep you updated on your uh, most important indicators and can help you if something uh, is going through a threshold, like your uh, delivery time to your customer is too high uh, or is too low, if the volumes of transaction is too high or too, or too low and so on. But apart from the traditional analytics, you can also start using machine learning. This is normally something that uh, people see as complex, but we are trying to make it easier uh, for you. Uh, so we have a platform, this SageMaker, that can help you find hidden patterns in your data. So maybe uh, understand if you have thousands or millions of customers, how they behave and maybe split them into categories automatically. And you can also build predictions uh, on top of models, like uh, let's predict how fast will be the delivery of this order uh, in the next weeks, how fast will be maybe the, 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 uh, the, the, the delivery of orders from your suppliers and so on. Actually, machine learning is a big chapter. And again, it's something where the cloud can really give you the tool to experiment freely and understand uh, the value that you can get. So with, uh, with uh, uh, machine learning, normally we have supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, supervised learning means you have some data repository that is labeled. So for example, you, your data is annotated by a human and it's uh, and you know uh, the, the 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 kind of content that is, uh, for example, in unstructured uh, an unstructured data set like a collection of images. You can have a person that can annotate these images, or you can do unsupervised learning where you really look for hidden patterns in the data. So the way to experiment with machine learning normally is to have uh, someone that does some expertise to create a notebook. It's like a virtual notebook where you can explore the data. Uh, you can then uh, prepare the data, train a, a machine learning model, and then use this model to build predictions. As I said before, you can estimate maybe how much time does it take for a delivery. You can estimate uh, if a customer is at risk of uh, leaving your company because he's probably not satisfied or, uh, by, what, by, by something that happened to him. Uh, or you can classify your customers in different categories so that you can create marketing campaigns for them. And Amazon SageMaker is providing you a framework to do all these things. To support uh, supervised learning, that is probably the, one of the most uh, powerful part today of machine learning, you need labeled data. You need data that is annot annotated by humans. So for example, if you have a series of images and you want to describe these images, if this image contains maybe an image of your product or not, and if it's one of your products, which product it is, uh, to do so, you really need uh, someone to look at these images. And that's why we created a tool that is called uh, SageMaker Ground Truth that can help you annotate and label your data uh, by humans. You can use an internal workforce inside your company. You can easily uh, use an external workforce like uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk to look at your data uh, for you and annotate your data. And, and it will also use machine learning to automate this process as it grows. In this way, you can really clean your data and annotate your data so that machine learning becomes more powerful. And now you can really leverage the, 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 the SageMaker platform. So you can use tools like uh, SageMaker Autopilot, uh, use a technology called AutoML to, uh, to uh, simplify the, 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 the creation of a, of a model. It's really almost everything can be automated and you don't need uh, much of an expertise, uh, but you just need to, to have a clean structured data that can be passed uh, to, to train and build a model. 
you can run experiments and test the different results of different experiments and different models on the same data set. You can uh, monitor your models to see if over time uh, there is a drift between uh, what uh, between what you uh, between what you provide and uh, what the model provides and what you expect. Uh, you can uh, use a debugger to inspect your uh, your model, and you can use uh, SageMaker Studio as a full integrated development environment that can help you do all this uh, multi even multiple times because normally machine learning is an iteration where you further optimize by checking and repeating. You can even deploy your machine learning models outside of a data center into a car, into a uh, IoT device using a tool like uh, SageMaker Neo. And further on, uh, we, we, we think human feedback is really important for machine learning models. That's why we created uh, Amazon Augmented AI that is a tool that can help you in cre create a human feedback based on the predictions that your machine learning model built to continuously iterate and, uh, and, uh, and uh, improve your, your model. Uh, this is really important specifically in the initial phase and also in the long run to keep your model uh, much, much more effective. And finally, I think uh, another big, uh, big important uh, aspect that is coming uh, and that uh, I'm really quite passionate about is quantum computing. This is something that many people think this is something far ahead, uh, why it should really relate to me. Uh, and uh, I'm surprised that uh, actually this is probably the best time to, ex to understand and, and start experiment with this technology. And it, I think it's really giving a, a next step into the power that the cloud can give you. So let's, let's do a very brief introduction to how the quantum computing works. Uh, so uh, normally we are used to store data into bits uh, and a, a one bit can have uh, two different values, can be zero or can be one. So for example, if we have a, a one bit here, bit number one, uh, we can, for example, uh, use this notation to say, okay, this bit, uh, I, I draw a white circle below the zero value. So this bit value is, is zero. And maybe if I have another bit, I can uh, draw a white circle below the number one. So this bit uh, has uh, value one. And if I have a third bit, then it must be zero one. So I need to repeat, repeat myself. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one again. Uh, so one single bit can't contain a lot of information, but our computers can contain and process millions, billions, trillions of bits, and that's the power of traditional computers. With quantum computers, things are different. Uh, with quantum computers, we try to leverage some of the strange behavior that we see when we go at very small scale in our, in our world, uh, where things are not so certain anymore. So uh, let's imagine that we have, uh, so normally we, we extend the concept of bits with what we call quantum bits or qubits. Uh, and these qubits here uh, are similar to the bits that we saw before. So instead of zero and one, we use this strange notation that is called, uh, by the way, bracket notation. Uh, that is, but it, we still have two states. There is a zero state and a one state. So the externally the, 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 the behavior looks similar. And I can have qubit one that is uh, with in the zero state, so it's a zero, and qubit two that is in the one state, and it's a one. So nothing different compared to bits. Things get interesting if I start to leverage what is called superposition. So a single qubit can be a little bit in one state and a little bit in another state. Actually, uh, what happens is that uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it has a probability to fall into one state or the other. So for example, qubit three, uh, I, you see now I have, I'm using white circles that don't fill uh, the full uh, space, but the, the, they represent the probability of, uh, of this qubit to be in state zero or in state one. So qubit three uh, has 50% chance to be in state zero and 50% chance to be in state one. And by chance here, I, means that, I mean that if I read this, it will fall into one or the other. Until I read it, it will have this uh, distribution of probability. And I can have lots of mix and match here. So for example, uh, qubit four uh, is another qubit that is 90% probability, has 90% probability to go into state zero or 10% to go in state one. 
So another thing that we can add, and it's not really important, but just to like, for the purpose of this session, but just to give you an idea of how complex it can be, the qubit can also have a phase. It's like a direction. So the relative phase of, of, of the qubits can be important. Uh, and, can, and, and this kind of phase, it's like having different direction will change when we interact with them. And we, the, the interesting part is that we can interact with more than one qubit at a time. Uh, uh, what happens here is that uh, we discover that particles can be entangled together and we are replicating this with qubits. So if two qubits are entangled together, if I change the state of one, I also affect the state of the other one. So working on one qubit will change the state of multiple qubits. And this is really powerful because now if we look at these qubits, we see that compared to the traditional bits, they can uh, really contain much more information because a single qubit has this probability part, has this phase. And if I change it, also the way it is uh, entangled with other qubits will uh, change and, and, and uh, the state of the other. So you can really build interesting things with one more, uh, with normally two or more qubits. So this is the final part of the technical uh, part of the technical slides on quantum computing. Now let's see from a business perspective uh, if, if these qubits are really useful. Well, they are useful because, as as we saw, they they behave differently from bits. So first of all, uh, in the first example that I made, you, there was this fifty percent chance to to get a zero or fifty percent chance to get a one when I'm reading a qubit. So Qubit express perfect randomness. And this is completely different than traditional computers. Uh, with traditional computers, we always use pseudo, pseudo random generator, pseudo random generators, because pseudo, it's impossible to have real randomness. Uh, and even if the, this is not a problem, if you have a few uh, generator, a few random numbers, if you do a massive simulation when you need millions of random numbers, uh, this can be a problem. So perfect randomness really changed the way you can use computers uh, for some specific uh, aspects. And actually, it turns out that the way qubits work together can also solve some problems uh, much, much, much faster than, uh, than with traditional uh, uh, algorithms. Because new algorithms are possible, uh, and two very popular ones are for search. So it, it turns out that with a quantum computer, if you have a, a, an an unordered uh, list of items, uh, you can search in this list very, very quickly. So instead of going through all the elements, uh, if you have an unordered list and you have to find one element, normally you have to go through all of it or half of it to find it. Uh, with, uh, with the Grover search algorithm, you, you can go only through the square root of the number of the elements. So instead of going through one million of elements, you can only go through uh, 1000, it's much, much faster if you have many elements. And also other algorithms like factoring uh, integral numbers is, it can be much faster. So this uh, really enables new applications. Uh, so as I said before, um, large scale simulations are much faster, uh, sorry, are much, much uh, more robust because you have pure randomness. Uh, optimizations problem are much faster because normally an optimization problem is a problem where you have multiple variables and you want to find the, the, the best value to may, maybe maximize your business or uh, minimize the latency of something. Uh, and since you can search so fast, uh, yeah, you can really find the uh, best solution in a much faster uh, time. And also with quantum uh, uh, computing, there's a new branch of machine learning with new algorithms that can uh, that are really making things more interesting and more uh, powerful. Uh, so new applications are possible, but uh, can I use these applications today or is it still this uh, rocket science? So what is interesting is that uh, we can use quantum computer in a relatively easy way. So if we look at, uh, at a traditional computer, we have a, a CPU no, that is doing most of the work. And we are quite used to extend the, the power of a CPU with external uh, coprocessors. So for example, in machine learning, it's very common to add a graphical processing unit, a GPU. Uh, and when you add a GPU, you actually don't need to know all the internal details of the GPU, how the, the, the semiconductor used to build the GPU works. You just use a high level framework, like for example, in machine learning, TensorFlow or PyTorch. 
uh, and these high level frameworks give you the uh, give you the, the the high level functions that you can use to uh, leverage the power of this gpu can we do something similar with uh, uh, quantum computing yes this is the approach we're taking now so the, the, the approach currently is to uh, connect a, a, a quantum computing unit a gpu uh, to your cpu uh, you have a, you need a way to move your memory from the cpu from your ram from the cpu to the gpu and then again, the idea is you don't need to know machine learning or all these details that I was showing before. You can use a high level framework, a high level library that is probably still developing over time. It's not as, as much as robust as what you can find in machine learning. But if you find these frameworks, uh, then you can just use these frameworks uh, as a library and quickly integrate quantum computing into your, uh, your, your applications and your analytics. So to help you explore and experiment with quantum computing, uh, we we launched uh, this year a new uh, a new service it's called Amazon Bracket. You remember Bracket is the name of the uh, notation that we use for the states of of the qubits. Uh, and using quantum computing it becomes much uh, easier. It's probably easier than what you think because the approach is similar to what you do with SageMaker. So you create a notebook, and then in this notebook you can use an open source uh library that we create this uh, bracket, bracket sdk and from this bracket sdk you can uh leverage libraries of uh algorithms and you can run this on a, on a simulator that we provide a powerful simulator that can simulate uh, uh, a quantum computer uh, with a few qubits or you can run uh, maybe after you validate the, the code uh, this on real quantum computers that are provided by some of our partners uh, that are connected to the Amazon Bracket service. So let's do a quantum demo. So I, I, <laughs> I really love to be able to write this into a slide. So let's do a quantum demo. Let's try to use this search algorithm. So the Grover search algorithm that I was mentioning that is very fast when you search one item in a list of uh, not or uh, that is not ordered. So you know if something is not in order and you need to find something, you need to go to all of them. So for simplicity, let's just take a small list of, with eight different values. So these eight values that you see here, and let's imagine that you want to find one of the values. For example, I want to search for one 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 into this list of uh, eight values, uh, and uh, and let's uh, use a, a quantum computer to to do so. So of course this is a uh, simplification but you know by taking things simple you can understand them and then you can apply them to a large scale problem so let's let's go into the the console so let me switch briefly this is, so this is amazon bracket and uh this is the console and here you have the availability of the of the quantum partners uh, and below you have the, 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 the availability of the simulator that we provide on AWS. And here you have also the visibility into how many qubits uh, we can uh, simulate with a single platform. Uh, D-Wave is slightly different, so that's why you see so many qubits, but normally we're, current technology is in the range of the tens of, uh, of uh, qubits. And the number, even if it seems small, it's really important because since they can be entangled, if you change the value of one, you impact on the others. Uh, so with 20, 30 uh, qubits, you can already do very interesting things. And here you can create uh, notebooks. So if I go, for example, on, on the notebook, uh, let me click here, uh, I can uh, open a, a notebook. We provide notebooks with uh, many examples. And uh, uh, this is the notebook on the search algorithm. So here uh, you, you get all the information if you want enter into the tails. But the interesting part here is that you have uh, uh, the, the, the code. Uh, so this is how the algorithms at high level work. So normally you have an initialization phase where you load into the qubit all the possible uh, configuration that you want to search for. So in this case, these eight values. Uh, and then there is what is called the Oracle phase. The Oracle phase means that this is a phase where the Grover search will, uh, with a, a single iteration, uh, try to find the, the value that you are looking for into this list. 
uh, but uh, as I was showing before, with qubits, you don't get only a zero or a one, you get a probability. And normally with the first iteration, this probability is slightly different for the right, right element compared to the other. So you need uh, uh, another step of amplification. It will amplify this probability. And then you can iterate here for a, a number that is normally the square root of the number of the elements. Uh, so for 1 million of elements to search, you, you only iterate 1,000 times here. And with this amplification, and, and uh, you amplify the, the probability of the uh, right element that you're looking for. So let's make this a little bit easier. So here we are. Uh, this is the code. This is Python. So it's if you already know Python, you can probably understand this. Uh, we are using the bracket, the open source bracket SDK. We are creating a local a local simulator. We are loading the possible values. Uh, and if we go further, uh, we see that we have the the the, the part here uh, where we run it. And uh, here I, I'm searching for the element one one one. Uh, into this list of eight values. And at the end, you get a very high probability that the element I'm searching is this one, uh, and th this low probability for the other elements. Uh, this is pretty easy since there are eight elements that think that this works with billions of items to search for. And, uh, and then if I search for a different element, I can get a different result. And the interesting part is that, as you see, we uh, we already embedded all the complexity of the quantum computing algorithm into a single function, this Grover. And I just need to uh, uh, call this function to get a result. So it's uh, you don't need to know the complexity below. You can just use this at high level uh, as a function. And if we go further here, we can run the same on a real uh, quantum computer. So the difference here is I'm not using the simulator. You can specify which quantum computer you want to use. Uh, the code is basically similar as before. Uh, the difference is that uh, now we're running a task that it works asynchronously and can take some time. And at the end, we get a result similar to the result before, uh, but with uh, a little bit more noise because the real quantum computers are a little bit more noisy than the simulator. Uh, but it's clear that this one wins. And since we're talking with probabilities, uh, you can increase the iteration. So if the result is not clear, like if this bar here was a little bit lower, you can iterate more and probability will automatically increase for the element that you're searching for. So with quantum algorithms, often you don't get a clean result, but you get a distribution of probability that tells you which is the probable solution uh, in a much faster time than a traditional platform. So this was a glimpse into quantum computing and how it works. And today, I think we saw many things. Now we saw how you can start leveraging the cloud to build a web application, how you can use uh, servers, containers, how you can leverage the power of serverless and make things much easier. Uh, you can use uh, analytics, you can really start into understanding how machine learning can improve your business. And if you want, you can start thinking about quantum computing and maybe be one of the first that can leverage that into your applications. So now what? I think we saw many things. So I think if I have to look into this, the most important message today is really, uh, if you want to build something, uh, time is probably the most limited resource that we have. So look for the tools that can really help you focus on what you want to build so that you don't waste time managing infrastructure, you don't waste time uh, uh, configuring storage, but you can really focus on, on, on the value that you want to build for your customers. Thank you. So now let me go back into Zoom and see if I can see the chat. Oh, sorry, I think you didn't see the console. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I will send a screenshot maybe later. Oh, so we have a few questions. Uh, I think we have time for the Q&A. Uh, can we use uh, auto uh, scaling with SageMaker instances? So uh, yes, uh, in different ways. So to optimize your cost in the training phase with SageMaker, probably the most useful things is to use spot instances. Uh, and normally you define the number of instances that you want for training. 
uh, but then when you uh, go into predictions, when you deploy your model to, to serve predictions, then uh, automatically SageMaker is built to use uh, auto-scaling. So that means that you create a, an endpoint for your machine learning model, and then from the machine learning model, you can, uh, you can uh, get predictions, and based on the number of predictions, it will automatically scale. So just to, 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 to recap, look into spot instances for training and then automatically we do auto-scaling for uh, the uh, endpoints. Uh, uh, question number two is Amazon is using interprocessor or so Amazon uh, currently we, we have, uh, we, we partner with different providers. So we have, uh, you can use uh, EC2 instances with interprocessor, you can use EC2 instances with AMD processor. Uh, and they are both x86 compatible. And more recently, we also start, we also have our own processor. It's called AWS Graviton. Uh, we are at the second generation with the Graviton 2. Uh, and uh, these are based on ARM technology. ARM is the same technology that you, it's used on, uh, on uh, smartphones, on a uh, device like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and ARM has also a specific design for data centers that we uh, import leverage for the uh, Graviton 2 processor. Uh, so you can really pick and choose the, the right architecture. So normally uh, ARM architecture are really efficient. So if you uh, normally are used to the x86 sword, uh, I think this is a good time to look into ARM and maybe test the Graviton 2. We just launched the T4G instances on EC2 with the Graviton 2 and there is currently a free trial so that a, T, a T4G micro uh, you get basically one without any cost uh, for the months of September, October, November, and December, uh, so until the end of the year. And yeah, okay, another feedback was on the console. I'm really sorry, probably I, I shared the, the, only the, 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 the PowerPoint screen. So let me see if I can, yeah, yeah. So this, I'm back, I'm now sharing the full desktop. So I, there's no time to do the full demo, but this is the, the notebook that I was trying to show you before. So uh, this is the Python code. This is the, the high level algorithm that I mentioned. This is the Python code using the bracket SDK. And, and this is the graph that I was mentioning. So the result that you get from uh, this platform. So this is the simulator. When you look for a 111 into the list of eight items, you get this high probability here. And if we go uh, uh, at the bottom, you have the real quantum uh, computer that is running. And this is the, the, the result of the quantum uh, uh, computer. We're using the uh, IMQ device here. And you see there's a little bit more noise. And this is the, the item you're looking for. Uh, uh, as I said before, you can iterate multiple times to increase the difference between the good result and the, and the low probabilities. Uh, but this is the kind of output that you should expect from a quantum algorithm, at least for, uh, for now. Okay, so I think my time is out uh, and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, provide me your feedback. You can provide me your feedback on Twitter and also provide me your feedback here on the platform. So to know what you like of this session. Thank you.